tonight we have a very special example of what I call excommunicating philosophy, namely the case of Spinoza. Um, so let me begin by reading the text of the harem or excommunication or ostracism document. Uh, and this was announced from uh, within the synagogue on the 6th of Ab in July of 1656. The Senhoras of the Muhammad make known to you how, having for some time received notice of the bad opinions and acts of Baruch de Espinoza, they have endeavored by various means and promises to turn him from his bad ways, and unable to correct him, on the contrary, each day receiving more information about the horrifying heresies which he practiced and taught, and about the monstrous deeds which he performed, and having many trustworthy witnesses who have deposed and testified on all of this in the presence of the said Espinoza, of which he was declared guilty. After all of this has been examined in the presence of the rabbis, they, that is the members of the Muhammad or governing board, have determined with the rabbi's review that the said Espinoza should be banned and separated from the nation of Israel, as they now put him under harem with the following harem. With the judgment of the angels and that of the saints, we put under harem, ostracize, and curse and damn Baruch to Espinoza, with the consent of blessed God and with the consent of this entire holy congregation, before these holy scrolls, with the 613 precepts which are written in them, with the harem that Joshua put upon Jericho, with the curse with which Elisha cursed the youth, and with all the curses that are written in the law. Cursed be he by day, cursed be he by night, cursed be he when he lies down, and cursed be he when he rises up. Cursed be he when he goes out, and cursed be he when he comes in. Adonai will not want to forgive him. The fury and zeal of Adonai will burn in this man and bring upon him all the curses that are written in this book of the law. And Adonai will erase his name from under the heavens. And Adonai will separate him for evil from all of the tribes of Israel with all the curses of the covenant that are written in this book of the law. And you that cleave unto Adonai your God, all of you alive today, we warn that no one should communicate with him orally or in writing, nor provide him any favor, nor be with him under the same roof, nor be within four cubits of him, nor read any paper composed or written by him. It's different from the kind of excommunication that Christians are familiar with because it's not just a liturgical act. It involves social, um, economic, um, very personal ostracism from the community. A person who is under the harem is not allowed to be called to the Torah in the synagogue, is not allowed to participate in a minion, does not count as a minion member, that is, um, but also is forbidden from engaging in very ordinary transactions with other members of the community until the harem is lifted. And very often the harem was lifted after the individual apologized for their offense and paid a fine. Um, and the typical harem document in Amsterdam in this period is much shorter and more matter-of-fact than the one that Spinoza received. Of course, the, the question is, well, what was Spinoza's offense? It's a bit of a mystery here because the document only talks about his bad ways, um, his horrifying heresies, and the monstrous deeds which he performed. Um, what exactly was it that earned Spinoza the most vitriolic and severe harem ever pronounced by the directors of this community? So on the one hand, there's a mystery. On the other hand, um, for anybody who's read Spinoza's works, um, there's really no mystery. Spinoza was born in 1632, and this community of Amsterdam was um, made up at this time mostly of refugees from the Inquisitions in Spain and Portugal or their descendants. And Spinoza's family was a well-situated merchant family in that community. Uh, and when Spinoza's father died, he had taken over the family importing business. Uh, this was in the early 1650s. And then all of a sudden in 1656, before, as far as we know, he had written anything. He was not yet the philosopher Spinoza. He was only 23 years old. He receives this karam. So what was it that he could have done? So some scholars have suggested that there were financial irregularities, that Spinoza had taken advantage of Dutch law to um, relieve himself of some debts that he owed both within the community, that his business owed um, within the community and outside of the community, because he was technically a minor, um, he could um, seek, um, seek relief from these debts and actually become a preferred creditor on his father and mother's estate. But by going to Dutch law, um, that was seen by the leaders of the Jewish community as a violation of the community's own regulations, which stipulate that these sorts of disputes need to be resolved within the community and according to the community's regulations. So Spinoza did, in fact, 
go over the heads of the community's leaders uh, and took advantage of the Dutch authorities to seek this kind of financial help. However, um, I don't think that really does a good enough job of explaining the length, the permanence, and the vitriol that we find in Spinoza's harem. I think we should take seriously um, the words horrifying heresies, and that Spinoza's offense here were a matter of ideas. First of all, Spinoza, in his philosophical writings, denies the providential God of the Abrahamic religions. Spinoza's God doesn't have any of the psychological or moral characteristics that one might expect of the biblical God in order to carry out any kind of providence. This God, Spinoza's God, doesn't have beliefs, expectations, doesn't issue commands, doesn't punish people, doesn't reward people in a kind of anthropomorphic way. Spinoza rejects all of that kind of depiction of God as a personal agent. Secondly, Spinoza argues in his theological political treatise that the, the ceremonial and liturgical laws of, of uh, the Torah are no longer valid and binding upon Latter-day Jews. They really only had their raison d'etre as long as there was a Jewish commonwealth with sacrificial rites performed in a temple. But with the destruction of the temple, all of those ceremonies and all of those rites have lost their foundation. And so Jewish law at this point in the 17th century, um, you know, a millennia, uh, a millennium after the destruction of the temple, uh, these laws are just superstitious practices. Third, Spinoza denies that there's any morally or metaphysically meaningful sense in which the Jews are God's chosen people. Um, all human beings are the same, metaphysically speaking. They are all a part of nature. Uh, the Jews did enjoy some political good fortune back in the kingdom days, but with the end of the Jewish commonwealth, that political good fortune is gone, and so is any kind of specialness. Um, the Jewish people are no more or no less, as a people, moral or special than any other people. Moreover, every single one of the community's rabbis at this time had written a treatise defending the immortality of the soul. And so I think Spinoza really picked on the wrong issue there. Um, and that might have been an especially aggravating factor in the decision to punish him in this way. Heading backwards from Spinoza's texts, which were written later and published much later, right. uh, into what could have been the horrible heresies, you think that none of what Seneca, uh, of what Spinoza said in his writings uh, qualifies as a horrible heresy? No, 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 I didn't say that. I think that, well, the other way around, I think there is, definitely there is a horrible heresy. No question about it. Steve li listed five uh, such heresies. I think that the one of them is something which seems to me to make sense, meaning the uh, rejection of the ceremonies. Chosen people, I'm not aware of anyone who was put on Helen because he rejected the chosen people. I mean... Who cares about it with all your respect? Now, this being said, you know, I, I, can I can I prove that there is no crazy person who in the 17th century decides that anyone who denies the principle, although there was never a principle of Jews being a chosen people, it was never taken to be a principle of faith anywhere within Jewish history. It's possible, but we have no evidence for that. So, so again, I think there was a heresy. Let's start with that. But I think there is a combination of heresy and actions. And to my mind, most likely, but again, I, I'm saying I don't know. Most likely, it's a combination of certain actions that, um, that included undermining of rabbinic authority, which is the most common. I would say about 90% of cases of harems are associated with undermining rabbinic authority. What were the effects? of this act for Spinoza in the first place, and then perhaps for philosophy in general? Um, well, the effect for Spinoza was that, that he was kicked out, and I think in many ways he was happy to be kicked out, right? I mean, that, that's fine. Um, I think that's right. His reaction was pretty much, <laughs> I, I was done with you anyway. Yeah in the 17th century as it looks from our perspective today, was it? I think he was a troublemaker. And and uh, and so I don't think that he'll, 
he did not belong to any any group, any community in the 17th century. And um, and that, that's interesting, right? I mean, that's a, it's a view of someone who is just, who lost his home and um, is thinking alone. And lost his financial means of support as well. Right. Um, so, you know, it's often suggested that Spinoza represents the first secular Jew. I think a better way of putting it is that Spinoza represents the first secular individual, somebody for whom belonging to this or that organized religion or religious identity really played no role in his self-identity. And we get a sense of that, and maybe I'm relying, uh, putting too much weight on the language he uses in his writings, but in the theological political treatise, the Jews are often referred to in the third person. They have emasculated themselves by their by their laws. They have suffered this and thus. So I, th I think he really has, um, he really represents in that sense, um, a secular individual, not a reformed Jew, not a secular Jew, but a secular individual whose sense of self is not informed by belonging to a particular religion. I, I, I think that Spinoza has a role in secularization, but I do think that Spinoza's notion of God is very significant in his philosophy. So again, many of the things here, the question is how precisely you define the notion that's at stake. In the 17th century, it was very difficult to not to belong to any tradition. I mean, we discussed about Galileo last time, and Galileo's jump into the uh, pur si move <laughs> direction um, didn't mean that he lost his attachment to the court of Florence. He had allies, he had students. Uh, he didn't jump into the unknown and he was not alone. So what you describe here seems to be something very different. Uh, Spinoza was not allied with anyone when he got into this trouble, was he? And he was never to be someone with powerful allies, or was he? Well, people adopted him <laughs> for their causes. Uh, yeah, I think the difference with Galileo is important here because Galileo, had you asked Galileo, are you still a good Catholic? He would say, yes, of course I am. Um, but we couldn't say of Spinoza, I don't think Spinoza himself would have said, um, I still belong to the Jewish tradition. I am Jewish. Even though um, his good friend, uh, Christian Huggins, the scientist, um, kept referring to him as the Jew of Vorburg. So in the eyes of the contemporary Gentiles, he was still a Jew. But I don't think he saw himself in that way. I, I don't know. I mean, I, I think that there is, uh, I'm, I'm, when I'm saying I don't know, it doesn't mean that I disagree. I'm, I'm, I think there are passages actually in the TTP, but, and also in the Hebrew grammar, where Spinoza speaks about the Hebrews and the Jews in the first person plural, we, or something like that. This being said, um, I think that he definitely saw a break. TTP is the theological political treatise which Spinoza published in 1670, and it immediately caused a huge scandal. Um, and one uh, critic called it a book forged in hell by the devil himself. And what's interesting about the TTP, taking up what um, Yitzhak just said, is that he, rather than attacking Christianity itself and its rituals and ceremonies, and also directly attacking current events in the Dutch, in the Dutch Republic, which he's very concerned about with the, the uh, Orthodox Calvinists usurping political power, um, rather than directly addressing those, he uses um, ancient Israelite history and especially the lessons of the ancient Israelite commonwealth to draw the moral lesson that hopefully his Dutch readers will take, namely that once you start dividing political power between civil authorities and religious authorities, you're in trouble. Oh, I was thinking whether you could say something about uh, Spinoza's attitude towards uh, Christians and Christianity. I think it's complex. I mean, I think uh, as far as I can see, um, Spinoza sees that there is definitely an element which he appreciates in, in Christianity. And more specifically, I think that his favorite biblical figure is Paul. But this being said, I would say that Spinoza's Paul is in fact a Spinozist. And I think that I can show you that in a, in a kind of a systematic manner in the TTP, um, he will ascribe to Paul almost every single Spinoza's doctrine. He will, uh, he will um, convert Paul into Spinozism. Spinoza, 
despite this um, sort of denigrating view of the prophets, he doesn't want to do away with the prophetic writings. And I think this also goes back to perhaps answering Grigor's question that the Bi he doesn't want to eliminate the Bible. He has a very reductive view of it. The Bible, as he says in the theological political treatise, is not literally a work of God because God doesn't write anything, but rather it's an anthology of human writings uh, compile, um, written over different periods by different authors in different contexts and with different aims. And then eventually these writings are, are handed down over the centuries and finally put together by editors in the Second Temple period. Um, so it's a corrupt and mutilated document that we have. However, it does preserve very effectively, Spinoza says, um, a divine message, and that divine message is the moral one, to love your fellow human beings and treat them with justice and charity. Now, most people are not philosophers and really have no chance of ever being philosophers, but they still need to be inspired to virtue. And there are two paths to virtue. One path is to read Spinoza's Ethics and <laughs> discover the truth about ourselves and about God and um, why we should treat other human beings in certain ways. And when you do it that way, you understand in a very deep way what you are and why it is in your own best interest to treat other human beings with justice and charity. But because most people are not going to be philosophers, they still need to be inspired to treat others with justice and charity. And the best way to do that is through edifying works of literature. And the Bible just happens to be a particularly good one at that. But let's say, in that sense, the Bible is divine. But let's say you're moved towards moral behavior, not so much by the Bible with all of its violence, but by reading Shakespeare or Dickens or Emily Dickinson poetry, whatever it may be, um, works of imaginative literature that move people to moral behavior are divine in Spinoza's sense. And so we shouldn't do away with the Bible because it may be the best tool we have for inspiring ordinary people, not philosophers, to be virtuous, to act virtuously, if not to become virtuous characters. He was asking whether Spinoza is more indebted to the Jewish tradition than to Descartes, or maybe he's equally indebted to both. Yeah, I would hesitate to quantify or say more or less. I mean, the, the ethics is such a rich text um, and draws, I think, on so many intellectual traditions. The vocabulary and is very Cartesian. Uh, the doctrines depart from Descartes in significant ways. There are Hobbesian elements. There are uh, very clearly Epictetan or Stoic elements. Um, Harry Wolfson in his 1932 uh, study of Spinoza, which, you know, I, it's a very, it's an extremely important work, but probably not I think exaggerates certain things, tries to lay out all the different traditions and all the different texts from which Spinoza drew. But uh, you know, I hesitate to say it's more Cartesian than Jewish or more Stoic than Hobbesian. I think that in terms of, of, uh, of criticizing um, anthropomorphic religion, he's much closer to, to my mind, to Maimonides, than to Descartes. I mean, Descartes, at the end of the day, wants God to be, have human characteristics. He wants God to have all kinds of perf human perfections just eminently, eminent terror. Spinoza will say, no way, nothing. But according to Solano, Spinoza told him that he was kicked out for these doctrinal offenses, his views on God, his views on the immortality of the soul, and his view on the law. So I, I think that his view on the law is seems to be again I, my suspicion that it's related to that. I mean, to the issue of, of his views on the law. So uh, I'll, 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 I'll stress it out. Now the question is, I, what precisely, um, what precisely Spinoza said, and how it is reflected through Solano's words, right? So I think that when you have someone like Solan, Solano saying that he was uh, that he that he believes that Spinoza believes in God only philosophically, we have a certain distortion, a distortion of that you expect from a vulgus. Um, it, now is we have other testimony. I'm, I'm not sure it's so significant, but you know, uh, Steve, you bring it in your book. 
Um, so you have the testimony of Lucas, who's saying Spinoza was not banned because he was uh, uh, he, because of of any kind of um, a denial of God's uh, existence, or but only because of uh, of rejecting the law or rejecting rabbinic law or something like that, right? To what extent Lucas is reliable here? I don't know. I'm not sure. But I think that uh, my claim it would be yes. I think we should take seriously um, Solano's testimony. I'm just saying we should also take seriously the fact that it is uh, it's not a philosopher, and there is something very bizarre in the framing of this claim. As far as I know, um, you, I don't think we have any documentation that there was speculation on the reasons for the harem. Um, unless it's like unless you know something, uh, but I've, I I no, don't. I I, I, I agree, Stephen, and, and and I think that's actually for me just a, a kind of a bizarre fact that we are three and three and a half centuries after the event, and we still don't know what are these horrible heresies and horror. I mean, we debate that. We have some suggestions. Uh, we have all kinds of exchange, but what precisely was it about? It's really intriguing, isn't it? Absolutely. It is, but everything about Spinoza is intriguing. That's why it's so easy to get obsessed with him because once he gets his claws in you, it doesn't let go. Think about how the TTP was such an amazing success in responding to the charge of atheism. There, there is something that is mind-boggling about uh, about how Spinoza was able to write these texts and think that really this is going to be the text that will secure me and, and will clean me from any suspicion of atheism, something like that. So I think that there is something, uh, he, he I, I don't know whether he, he was an Asperger person or something like that, but there is a sense in which I don't think that he had a, a very clear um, understanding of the political context of many of his actions. At some point, I think he understood that, and then, that's why he didn't publish the ethics. Well, actually, that was my background for the question. Was he feeling, him, seeing himself as a sort of prophet? Someone that comes with something entirely new that the world should listen to because this is the truth. I, I think in that sort of non-technical sense of prophet, um, sure, why not? He, he saw that the Dutch Republic was in serious danger um, and he had a vision of where that danger was coming from. And I believe... I think Isaac may be the first person to ever accuse Spinoza of being an Asperger on the Asperger spectrum or the autism spectrum. But um, I think he had a, he thought that he needed, I, I think we could see the, um, the, the TTP as a kind of Jeremiad, a, a warning to his contemporaries. So in that sense, perhaps there is something prophet-like about it. What were the consequences of Spinoza's excommunication for the history of philosophy? It's actually said that this was a foundational story for the European Enlightenment. Can you elaborate? I, I think that so. Uh, um, okay. I, I think that there was a, uh, a, a view here that basically took Spinoza as a secular saint. Uh, on the one hand, and and it also had some. Uh, it was associated also with a view of Judaism as as being a backwards culture, which you find especially in the late 18th century, early 19th century, which has some racist elements, to be honest. Um, now, um, the the creation of Spinoza is a, is a saint to secularism is fascinating. I mean, I think that Spinoza himself begins this story. In in some way, there are passages, if you look carefully at the TTP, you'll see passages where he's speaking as if he's himself Christ. So I think that he, he was sensing that. And the view, the association of Spinoza with Christ will develop very significantly in later stages, later stages. So uh, Heine will develop that, but he's definitely not alone. I mean, so... To, um, so Spinoza becomes, if, if you wish, the the the, the uh, saint of of secular of modern secularism. And another way to answer Dana's question is uh, to take the counterfactual approach. What would what would have happened had he not been put under harem? 
um, would we have the ethics in the theological political treatise or would he have just have remained um, a success, a mildly, moderately successful businessman in the Amsterdam Portuguese Jewish community? I don't know. I mean, I, I think that uh, it's it's a good question. I mean, what do you think, Steve? So I'm thinking of the opening paragraphs of the, his early work, which was called the Treatise on the Emendation of the Intellect, in which he explains, doesn't mention the cherem, but he explains his lack of satisfaction with the life of a merchant. He says that these are transitory goods and not fully satisfying. And so I thought I would turn towards uh, the project of trying to discover more a more lasting good a truer good a more satisfying kind of life so i think even had he not been put under harem it's hard i'm tempted to think that he still would have turned to philosophy and begin putting his thoughts uh on paper he was obviously dissatisfied with the the mercantile life he was living yeah i i would agree and and i think that there is a chance that he would have been one of these uh, radical jewish thinkers it's a possibility he might have he might had to he, he might ha have to write in a kind of a more subtle manner even more than before i don't know but that's definitely a possibility that was open to him one thing i should stress however is that spinoza himself doesn't think that that excommunication is illegitimate Right, we have this wonderful passage at the end of the TTP, where Spinoza is give, giving us a list of the functions of the church in his ideal state, and this passage basically gives us a list which includes almsgiving, deciding doctrines, and excommunication, and and that's in the good state. So for him, yeah. well. Well, that's that's part. I mean, I, I, we can look at this passage if you're interested. But yeah, it's a. Uh, so you are basically saying that he wanted to be out of the community. Well, that's I think pretty clear. I mean, it's clear that they 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 did the service for him. Uh, listen, he. Uh, my sense is was he was probably three times more intelligent than the people who were who, who put him on hell, and. Um, so you know, it, it, they put him on cherem. At least, Pat, again, that's my image, and that it was you got rid of a fly on your shoulder. Okay, gesund. That's Yiddish for farewell. <laughs> you know, unlike so many other philosophers, especially in, in this period, Descartes, Leibniz, um, there's such a fascination with Spinoza outside of academic circles and. You know, you won't run into many Cartesians or Leibnizians on the street or Aristotelians, maybe Aristotelians, but you'll find people who describe themselves as Spinozists. Um, and Spinoza has entered not just the broader intellectual culture, and there's a lot of interest in him outside of philosophy and in religious studies and Jewish studies and literary studies, but also um, in popular culture, the fact, and artistic culture, the fact that there are operas and novels and poems and works of visual art devoted to Spinoza. Um, that is just, it's really striking. Um, novels about Spinoza appear and he is a, um, he makes cameo appearances in quite a few works of literature. It, that's something worth investigating, um, both in Jewish culture and in contemporary popular culture. It's up. So I, I would stress two points. First, uh, just with regard to all the questions about uh, why not lift the cherem. So there was an attempt to have a kind of a ceremony of lifting the cherem. I mean, I think it was 1927, the Hebrew University in Jerusalem. And um, a person, um, uh, what, the first professor of Hebrew literature at the Hebrew University at the time, um, announce some sort of a lifting. Actually, it was not precisely a lifting of the harem. It was, a, it was the cancellation of mutual complaints on both sides. And he, and, and he did a ceremony with all kinds of almost magical words of saying, uh, the harem is just uh, canceled hereby, or et cetera. Uh, that guy who was after, who was uh, also the, uh, the uncle of the, of the uh, writer, the novelist Tomosos 
was a populist. I mean, he was a professor of Hebrew literature, and and it was really feature fitting for this kind of populist attempt to say, okay, we'll have some sort of a ceremony day of just uh, in the opening of the of the Hebrew University or something like that. Eventually, uh, the st- second point I, I'll say, I think it's not a coincidence that Spinoza was um, both a, a very independent thinking figure and also homeless philosopher. I mean, there is something which, when you are homeless, when you don't have commitments to all the ideology, the, the many of the ideologies, at least of of uh, of your community, your state, etc., people are able to say, think boldly and sometimes even clearly. The philosopher that doesn't have a real place everywhere, that's very much the Socratic model, isn't it? Yeah.